Welcome everyone. Uh, this is Mutual Exchange Radio. Uh, my name is Corey Massimino, and I'm talking to the editors of the now 10 years old Markets Not Capitalism, uh, one of the most influential texts uh, in the last 10 years for, for a lot of left libertarians uh, coming up with the ideas. Uh, we're here with Gary Chartier, who reads and writes various things that might be of interest to some listeners. And we're also here with Charles Johnson. Charles is an individualist anarchist technologist and sometimes writer living in the Deep South, and he keeps a long-running blog at radgeek.com and a repository of freely available online texts at fair-use.org. So thanks for being with us, Gary and Charles. Thanks for taking your time to talk to us about the 10-year anniversary of a book that was very influential on me and and really most most people in the, in the political orbit I know, I would say, by far uh, more than a lot of recent texts, uh, I would say. And so that's why I really wanted to sit down and kind of Talk to you all 10 years later, um, what do you think of it and, and, and how its legacy has shaped things. So could, maybe we can start. You can just, I assume most listeners will have read it. Uh, if not, um, they should, and we'll surely include the free link to, so people can read it. But could, could, could each of you maybe describe the, the main idea that you wanted people to take away from the book in, in a short sentence or two? Sure. So sure. Um, I guess I can jump in on that. Um, Go ahead. So uh, I wanted to put it in a, in a short sentence. The short sentence would be uh, something along the lines that, uh, uh, along the lines that a uh, conventional critique of capitalism and a conventional defense of capitalism that has been common uh, across the political spectrum, both from uh, uh, anti-capitalist perspectives, um, uh, you know, both from the radical left and also uh, from the right, but also uh, within the libertarian world, those seeing themselves as defending uh, defending capitalism um, has uh, uh, essentially missed a key distinction, a distinction between markets on the one hand and capitalism on the other. There are many um, uh, so there are many uh, evils uh, frequently laid at the feet of uh, uh, sort of the capitalist economy around us. Um, uh, there are also uh, sort of many uh, common. Um, uh, there, there are many things to be said. On the other hand, on behalf of market freedom, entrepreneurial discovery, um, uh, in, you know, individual small scale ownership, um, and sort of other features of the market formed, and that the the problems of economic privilege and stratification that we see around us are often. Uh, often real and substantial social and economic evils that ought to be combated, but they're not in fact the product of the market form. They're the product of markets deformed by political privilege. Um, so that's, you know, that's one of the sort of the core proposition that's, that's embedded in the title. Uh, of course, the book as a whole is intended as an introduction to a larger conversation uh, uh, among uh, sort of Individualist, uh, individualist anarchists, market anarchists, uh, mutualists, and other sort of related tendencies. Uh, and so there's, uh, you know, the, the idea behind the book is to provide sort of a comprehensive introduction to that conversation, both including points of agreement and also points of disagreement among the people involved in it, uh, and open questions as well. I think what Charles said is great, and uh, I don't have anything substantial to add to it. I guess my sentence would be, markets are emancipatory, and the understanding of markets as emancipatory uh, is rooted in a really fascinating tradition that you, the reader, should know more about. Okay. Uh, what I'm curious to hear how you, uh, you both would describe the ideological atmosphere in which you came upon the idea to put this together and decided to do it. Uh, you know, uh, what was the, and especially, you know, the place of these ideas of, of left market anarchist ideas in, in the broader discourse. Back, back, back when you, when you put the book yeah. together, how would you describe that? I mean, it seems like there was a, uh, a critical mass of left libertarian, left market anarchist uh, ideas kind of just coalescing from my perspective, in the early 2000s, uh, that the, uh, you know, the internet really brought together people from a variety of ideological, geographical, and institutional locations. Um, and what had otherwise been uh, a situation in which, you know, various people had uh, uh, popped off about various topics really became 
a recognizable tendency, a tendency that was distinctive vis-a-vis both sort of the American libertarian movement and the the American uh, anarchist uh, movement. And as a result, um, I think there was just increasingly the perception that a statement um, that encapsulated what was going on with this distinctive tendency would be uh, would be helpful. Um, I'm not sure I was even thinking strategically when I had a conversation with Charles at an Appy event in Vegas and said, you know, we, we should do this book. Um, I think I found myself just thinking there's a bunch of cool stuff here and it would be fun to collect it and make it available in a, in a more consistent form. But I think looking back in retrospect, at least my perception would be um, it had this tendency coalescing and uh, it really needed to be represented in a more kind of uh, comprehensive uh, and uh, focused way. Yeah, I think that's um, uh, yeah, sort of much the same thoughts of, uh, along those lines as, as Gary does. I guess just I'd, uh, um, uh, what, what I'd want to add in there is just that, you know, so I, I certainly hope that the book has uh, a great deal of lasting value, both for the, the um, uh, historical materials that are in it, also in its applicability to uh, um, you know, its, its applicability to sort of ongoing uh, ongoing debates and crises and situations that we face to this day. But the the sort of the new writing that forms the core of the book, to put it into historical context, is essentially from a series of conversations that are happening. Um, uh, large, you know, largely mediated through the internet, as as Gary says, through sort of the the mid you know, sort of mid period of of emerging political writing on the internet, um, uh, in the age of sort of the uh, you know, sort of after the Seattle demonstrations, um, uh, and in the age of sort of the Bush administration and the bailouts. Uh, uh, so the book is released in 2011. Right, the um, core of the writing that that makes it up kind of dates from, let's say, roughly 2004 up to uh, up to about 2010, 2011, and so a great deal of that is is uh, sort of shaped by the context of uh, uh, the new, you know, sort of the the new resurgence of the warfare homeland security state uh, in the U.S. and in other Western powers, uh, this is glo- you know, the environment of the global war on terror. Uh, and the economic environment of the uh, corporate economy that that preceded the the global financial meltdown and the global financial meltdown and the Great Recession and slow recovery from it. And so that sort of I think shapes a lot of the particular economic concerns that go into the economically focused uh, essays that are in. So I see. So <clears throat> I see. So even if you weren't uh, both 100% cognizant of the time of this. You definitely now see that, um, kind of see what you're doing is, you know, making concrete ideas that were in the air, that were organically uh, developing, and, and you collected them in this edition, um, which is quite nice of you now for all of us. And, yeah, you, I mean, I, I think it's definitely part of, part of collecting ideas that are in the air. Uh, I mean, this is also the times leading up to Occupy. Um, there's also like, you know, uh, uh, endogenous, you know, sort of weird libertarian stuff going on that happened to shape conversations in these directions and bring together the the writers, yeah. sort of arguing with each other in the core of the book. Well, there's always weird libertarian stuff going on. <laughs> I I, I want to ask. You mentioned him a little bit in the introduction, and of course, he has a few essays, a few fantastic essays in the book. But you dedicate the book specifically to the memory of Carl Hess. Uh, I, I'm kind of curious myself, and I think the, the the listeners would be if either of you could speak more to that particular decision. Yeah, Gary, you want to take that one? Sure. So uh, my, you know, I don't remember an actual conversation about this. I remember uh, uh, maybe just uh, uh, yeah. It's it's interesting to to try to remember how how that ultimately came about. I would say you know Hess is somebody who really tried to embrace uh the new left uh after having been a you know quite conventional conservative for a long time and uh you know with the real enthusiasm of a convert uh he uh um found himself uh, kind of immersed in 
in uh, the world of the new left and in helping to build build bridges uh, between the new left and uh, uh, and various facets of the libertarian movement. It seems to me that while the uh, American old left with its Stalinist uh, associations and, and so forth was, or, or Trotskyist for that matter, was really, uh, you know, probably not a natural partner uh, for libertarians and market anarchists. Uh, the new left with its uh, a commitment to decentralization and uh, openness to experimentation and uh, willingness to see uh, economic and social arrangements as opening up space for inclusion of uh, uh, you know, various previously marginalized groups. Um, and it's just kind of instinctively anti-authoritarian attitudes made a natural partner, uh, I think, for, uh, uh, for libertarians in the 60s and, uh, and 70s. And I think it was, you know, of course, very unfortunate that uh, the attempt to maintain that partnership didn't persist. I think Hess was a guy who kind of exemplified uh, the uh, goal of bringing many values that were kind of recognizably associated with the, with the new left uh, into the libertarian movement, and at the same time linking the libertarian movement uh, with the new left. Plus, I have every reason to believe, uh, not having known Carl personally, but just based on what I've read of his, but what I hear about him from others, that he was both a very creative and a very decent guy, and uh, and someone who was uh, uh, was admirable in that way. So I think he he both uh, represented a uh, an actual historical tendency that. Uh, uh, I think we we welcomed and at the same time represented uh, just a kind of personal, uh, you know, per, he, he, his, his personal narrative, I think, was, was also one that was, uh, was more appealing than mine. It's, uh, it's interesting to me that, because you, you, you mentioned how Hess was a conservative, came from that background. And it's so, it's kind of funny to me because my understanding is both of you came much more from the left wing, although perhaps different flavors of left wing, backgrounds and then only later came to kind of meld your ideas with uh you know some of the the libertarian ideas about markets and, and their use so it's it's actually fitting it seems maybe the reverse of hess both of you to dedicated to him yeah and so um, um charles uh, to to that? Yeah. yeah so like uh uh you know one of the one of the things that's that's really notable i think about hess's Development in the '60s, you know, when uh, as I think Jerry Jerry Tusili talks about, sort of, you know, look, there's Carl Hess breaking the ideological sound barrier. Um, uh, is this this you know shift from Republican speechwriter uh, to you know, uh, having? Uh, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't swear to the claim that he coined it, but at least one of the first appearances of the word anarcho-capitalist uh, that that anyone can find mm -hmm. in print. Um, and then into you know. Uh, uh, sort of deep into, uh, uh, you know, sort of the new left and that uh, uh, throughout, despite these sort of, you know, despite these big, co you know, these big sort of shifts in terms of his own thinking and in terms of who's he, who he's associating with that, you know, so, so he, he really, in a lot of ways, I think represents some of the best spirit of, of what we call in the introduction, kind of the, uh, the second wave of sort of a, a free market anti-capitalist or individualist anarchist conversation um, that he is, you know, immensely open to um, uh, sort of you know, trying out ways that his, his ideas could meld with the ideas of uh, sort of the counterculture and of, of the anti-war new left um, and of trying to find ways to, uh, you know, to sort of um, work out individualist insights, not only in sort of his own, you know, his own familiar milieus, but in, in uh, sort of many contexts, but, but genuinely sort of embracing what he felt like he could take from his conversation partners. Uh, you know, so, so um, Murray Rothbard, uh, who also produced a bunch of great work at this time, um, uh, uh, in the period of left and right and sort of the early, early libertarian forums, uh, you know, would, would at times sort of um, uh, criticize Hess for not seeing the connection with, uh, with the new left as sort of a, a, a purely strategic coalition. Um, uh -huh. uh, and as sort of, you know, that as Murray Rothbard saw it, sort of accepting, accepting too much of the left's ideas, 
Now, of course, you know, if you have a mix of ideas, some of which are right and some of which are wrong, uh, sort of you know, being, a, being a good guy about it is not a reason to take the wrong ideas in. But I think that, that in fact, what, uh, you know, what Murray saw as uh, a problem for, for uh, sort of Hess's approach was actually one of its great virtues, that um, uh, he was willing to uh, sort of try to think through, uh, think through how his own ideas would work within frameworks very different from his own and to try and take the best, uh, the best out of that conversation rather than just sort of coming in with a pre-established framework and then exiting with the same framework later. Um, I also just want to, so if, if, if folks are interested in learning more about Carl Hess, I think besides reading his writing, which is, which is fantastic, there's a, there's a couple of great documentaries, um, uh, both filmed around, right around 1980, uh, one of which is Anarchism in America, uh, the other of which is specifically about, about Carl's, uh, Carl Hess toward liberty, uh, which both give him a whole bunch of screen time and a whole bunch of time to talk um, uh, sort of reflectively about how his own ideas evolved and how they fit into the picture of anarchism in the United States. Um, what is, <clears throat> did, did, I'm, I'm really curious if when you both were sitting down and, and, and developing the idea for this book, uh, I mean, you kind of talked about this maybe a little bit, but I'm curious more specifically, if, if you did have any real explicit goals um, in the, either the short or long term with putting together such a collection, um, or if, or if, uh, maybe you didn't think about it like that. I think Charles did a marvelous job of spelling out a vision for the book in the more theoretical portions of the introduction, which are, which are essentially his work. Um, and it may be that those were all clearly in mind for him from the beginning. Um, for me, I think it was more a matter of just thinking, uh, this is cool and interesting and hasn't been done elsewhere. Let's do it. And, uh, uh, kind of letting the, the shape and the focus of the, uh, of the collection emerge as we, as we put it together. Uh, and so, uh, I don't think there was perhaps as much ideological self-consciousness as there might've been uh, on my end, but, uh, Charles can perhaps speak to a different experience. On I'm, 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 I'm immensely honored by, by Gary's kind words about that. I, I think that a lot of the practical impetus in, in my recollection, Gary, you can feel free to, uh, you can feel free to put me straight if I'm misremembering any of this, but, um, you know, I, I certainly remember a lot of the practical impetus for it coming from Gary. I'd been, you know, sort of, um, fiddling around for some time at this point with, uh, uh essentially producing, you know, like, um, the market anarchy zines, the anarchist classic series yeah. zines and sort of small, small printed materials aimed at, uh, sort of trying to assemble like a little bit of a, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of a library that, that folks could use, you know, like at a book table or just hand out, um, that contained a lot of the essays that ended up going into this. And it sort of played around with the idea of trying to put together a larger anthology. Um, yeah. Uh, Gary really, you know, sort of approached me after the Appy event and uh, um, sort of really drove home, I think, the value of, of moving on this and getting it put together. Um, Gary, I think, I think, in fact, wasn't it that you had a, a class coming up that you wanted to use it as a reader for? Interesting. I don't, I'm not sure whether I did that. There's a class that I did for which it would have been appropriate as a reader, but I don't, yeah, I'm not, your memory is, uh, I'm sure better than mine here. Uh, I can totally see it as a reader for classes in general and for one of mine in particular, but I don't remember exactly how I, how I included that and what mm -hmm. I might've said. Uh, but yeah, no. So, and, and so, you know, we, we had a certain amount of work that was already done for us just by having sort of a big selection of stuff that had either gone into like the, gone into the zine series or gone into sort of other small, uh, sort of small DIY publishing projects. You know, Gary sort of you know, brought me a, a, a list of stuff that he was already, um, you know, that he was interested in, um, and and throughout kind of the whole the whole process of giving the book uh, a shape and a structure was was sometimes a matter of you know like trying to um, uh, trying to sketch out some plans and writing out the introduction and seeing what would go along with the direction that it was taking as as it took shape. It, a, a lot of it was also always just you know the the necessary process of sort of getting the scalpel and cutting stuff down. So we had probably about twice as many pages of stuff that, that we would have liked to put into the book than, than what we ended up with. And we just had to kind of figure out like, you know, 
given that we have to cut X, Y, and Z, what kind of, uh, what kind of organization would, would help us sort of rationalize that choice? And then once we've done that, you know, like, uh, sort of what makes sense as, as a way to sort of, uh, organize the book and what makes sense as a way to sort of think about sort of how we're progressing from chapter to chapter. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, you know, I mean, I remember, I remember sketching out an organizational model, uh, for the, the material we had kind of settled on. Uh, that Charles then, uh, you know, substantially uh, enhanced. And uh, uh, so I think, uh, and uh, yeah, as with the introduction, so with the structure of the book, uh, you know, what's, what's there uh, in, in your hand as a reader uh, is something that, uh, yeah, would, be, would, uh, would not be the same, uh, certainly, had, uh, had that creative work uh, on Charles's part not been, been, uh, been done. I really feel like, where this was concerned, I, I mean, I mean, I guess I contributed, uh, you know, one of my own essays, but my my contribution was, I think, less creative and more just kind of kind of nuts and bolts. Whereas Charles did, I think, a lot of really, uh, really uh, insightful work uh, in uh, both contributing his own work and in in framing things and uh, structure. Well, I, th I think, uh, regardless of, of intentions or what maybe long term goals you. You both had in mind it, it definitely came at the right time and i think it was the good mix of literature because it really is the i think it really did lay a foundation for a lot of a lot of work that a lot of stuff that i've done a lot of stuff that other people and uh contemporaries <laughs> have done who have been influenced by this um you know both both ideologically and in and broad terms and, and and theoretically in terms of the specifics um i did want to ask and you and you mentioned this just now charles uh but either of you can speak to this depending on your memories uh, but what uh, what were some of the texts that that you could not include at the end of the day that you remember really wanting to and being hard to cut? Yeah, somewhere I'm sure I have a record of this, and uh, <laughs> it would uh, I could have hunted that up if I had uh, had known we were <laughs> looking for that that information. Um, some of it's on a computer that's not immediately accessible to me, and some of it would be an email I'd have to hunt to hunt for. Okay. Well, um, yeah, the the stuff the stuff that tended to get uh, the stuff that tended to get um, cut out to my recollection was was either stuff where we um, uh, you know there were essays that that we really wanted, but we also wanted to make sure that there's sort of a um, a range of views, for example, in, in you know the the ownership section of the book, which has I think what about four or five essays we ended up with. Um, there's a great deal more that that we would have wanted to include. Um, some of it by Roderick Long, some of it by other authors on um, uh, property rights, the topic of property rights in general, and sort of common and and uh, intellectual property in particular that that ended up kind of. Um, uh, Falling to the wayside, and in in you know uh, uh, sort of essays from deeper in the historical tradition as well, uh, essentially because you know we have a limited number of pages, and we wanted to preserve the format of that that section as kind of a, a debate and a disagreement among differing approaches to to ownership, which have sort of the the result of uh, you know sort of. Uh, uh, Strong defense of individual private property ownership, but coming coming to it from different justificatory perspectives, and also you know ending up with with somewhat uh, somewhat different ways of approaching sort of hard and borderline cases. Um, there are also uh, there are also a, a number of essays on um, uh, environmental uh, civil rights, uh, anti racist and femi feminist and gay liberationist activism that um would have been really good in the book but you know uh, we're sort of uh, running out of pages at the end of the book and and we you know had some material in there and had to go with kind of what we had it's funny you mentioned the the desire to have had more essays in particular by roger Wong in the ownership section because i'm looking at it now and he already has two essays yeah. of the five in that section one of them uh being as you mentioned the libertarian case against intellectual property rights which is probably my favorite single essay mm -hmm. on that issue yeah but i mean i, yes, I there are definitely if, many good ones it, to have included yeah if if it were possible to do so i would have been happy to have you know uh, a whole book that's just on certain property rights disputes yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yes, I, I have I have often thought about because I think to get a, a, a bit of, a bit of a fuller picture of the whole ideological discourse surrounding this book and the writers and 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 the ideas it spawned, um, you would uh, there would be you know maybe a part nine on what you were just saying about uh, how these issues interact with with anti racism and with feminist causes and and, mm-hmm. with, and with queer liberation causes. You have some of that in here. You have Sheldon's great article, Sheldon Richmond, Libertarianism and Anti Racism, mm-hmm. and you have a couple good environmental pieces. But uh, but I but I definitely see how you had to keep it down and, and narrowed it to to more specifically economic uh, topics and concepts. Yeah, maybe so, there's room yeah. for a second edition for of those. Book. No, exactly. It was, it, it was definitely important for us to have material on sort of perspective, perspectives on social justice and environmental activism within the book. Because this one of the um, one of the key themes of the book is that. Um, uh, as as I understand it, is is you know, that um, uh, individual liberty and market order include mm-hmm. our driving social activism, right? That uh, when we talk about spontaneous order, spontaneous order includes cultural orders, um, both from the standpoint of critique and also from the standpoint of conscious activism. Um, and you know, so uh, the the material the material that's in there. Uh, we definitely sort of wanted to make sure at least some of it is in there, uh, in order in order to indicate yeah, that there, are, you know, there there are, there are further conversations within individualist anarchism that this can lead on to uh, that are not that are not sort of simply precluded because you know we have to talk about the land monopoly or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. You're definitely touching on uh, your essay in the last section. We are market forces. I think that's quite revelatory for for a lot of libertarians who read that and bringing the the you know capital m market down from the platonic heavens i guess uh, very mm-hmm. useful thing and, and leading into the discussions even if if there wasn't enough room as you wanted for, for them um and somewhat relatedly and maybe neither of you have a great answer off the top of your head for this and that's fine but are are there things that you would in the that have come out in the past 10 years that have uh you know struck you as well that would have been a perfect fit or that would have been a nice addition to Marx, not capitalism. I'm sure the answer is yes, but I'm not immediately coming up with, uh, you know, an obvious, uh, obvious example. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I don't have, I, I don't have a list of uh, a list of essays ready to go because I hope this, you know, this this kind of anthology is already in the works from from other hands, uh, honestly. But uh, if oh, I hope if if I were um, uh, if sort of you know. Uh, Time traveling me was working on this book, but got dropped off uh, in the present day and was looking around a bit. I think one one thing that we don't talk about that would be you know another thing to be spending pages on, but but would be uh, important in the present context, and that there's been a lot of really good writing about, and that I'd you know, be interested in sort of trying to put together a list about is is in particular sort of individualist uh, individualist anarchist and and um, left wing market anarchist uh, takes on. Um, technology, both as a social force and also in, in the form of the technology industry, I think has become, you know, of course, yeah, the, this certainly yeah. was a major focus in 20, 2010, 2011. Um, but it's, it's, you know, um, of course, it's, it's a, um, shall we say, somewhat debated issue within the anarchist milieu. Um, uh, and it's also, I think, a really important issue and an issue that's core to a lot of the most interesting conversations right now around capitalism and, and uh, market society um, that that it would be great to touch on more and that that we can both get sort of good uh, contemporary material on also uh, some of the historical material as well from from previous waves of the market anarchist conversation it it strikes me that uh, uh, there might have been uh, you know if I were in the same position uh, Charles was and I would I'd absolutely uh, enthusiastically opt for including some uh, interestingly contrasting discussions of, of technology. Um, it strikes me that there might well have been uh, a bit more room for some conversations related uh, to, uh, broadly speaking, criminal justice mm-hmm. and to immigration. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I want a kind of uh, 
leads into into another question I wanted to ask. Uh, you know, given the last ten years or so developments in um, you know the political atmosphere, particularly in in the United States, um, is there anything maybe that you would have changed about the book, knowing the developments in the past ten years? Um, you know, the we've seen socialist ideas gain a lot more popularity, especially among young people in America. We've seen nationalism uh, boom, and we've also seen, in many ways, the decline of libertarian conservative fusionism that this book uh, kind of indirectly was Bummer. hedging against. Yeah. Bomber. Yeah, I'm being obvious. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I, I, so I think something about nationalism would have been would mm. have been very very helpful, and it seems like the um, yeah the tradition would have would have given us uh, something interesting to work with. It would have been nice to, to draw on uh, something there because yeah, nationalism has been so virulent in uh, in the U.S. and of course uh, elsewhere in the world uh, in uh, in that intervening period. Um, yeah, that, that my I mean, so I think the topics we've already addressed of uh, of technology and uh, perhaps also crime and uh, and immigration, all appropriate, all you know, would have been nice to see things there because of the importance those topics assumed in the intervening period. But certainly, something about nationalism uh, would have uh, helped to set the stage for uh, you know encounters with um, you know people with uh, sort of incoherent uh, ideological packages like national anarchism, uh, you know, and uh, folks who want to provide various sorts of anarchist justifications for what are really just straightforwardly nationalist programs that I think we want to under a good job. Well, you have, uh, to me, Charles's uh, piece, uh, not in the book, but, but, but on C4SS and in various zine formats, uh, the essay against all nations and borders. I think maybe could could it it could have been the whole part, just that essay, because that to me is the definitive uh, statement on on nationalism from a libertarian perspective. Uh, I'm curious what uh, if you you know not everyone can can just necessarily sit down and read through 400 pages. Of this, of this deep stuff, but that's quite nice that it's divided up into parts and these short little essays. If you had to, is there an essay that comes to mind or, or a part of the book that comes to mind that you might suggest on the one hand to, you know, kind of a, you, uh, an ardent, uh, you know, right libertarian capitalist, and on the other hand to, uh, you know, uh, anti-authoritarian communist, uh, things that would resonate and speak their language to them? Because I feel like the book is always, I feel like the whole project really is kind of treading water between trying to yeah. communicate to both of these camps almost at the same time, which isn't really an impossible task. But, but I wonder if there's any specific thing that comes to mind about that would appeal to one or the other. I think that I think the most important uh, uh, essay in the book that both groups and everyone else should read uh, is Charles's in part one. Uh, so, I th you know, I think that that um, I mean, you know, so did, what people should read depends on what they're interested in. And there's a bunch of different stuff because people come at this from many different directions. I think for right libertarians who have an interest in history, um, Roy Childs' Big Business and the Rise of American State is, mm. is uh, mm. a really nice and useful synthesis that that provides, you know, sort of one of the best ways in the book of just sort of understanding what's going on with with the rest of their book and, and starting off from, you know, a really brilliant guy who's um, uh, uh, effortlessly speaks the language of his, of his fellow sort of lazy fairy libertarians. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of sort of, um, you know, various sorts of non-market, uh, non-market uh, anarchists coming at this from you know, what we might sort of oversimplifiedly call sort of a left anarchist uh, a kind of perspective. Um, you know, I don't know. I think that, that um, uh, Voltaire Declare and Rosa Slobodinsky's uh, pieces, The Individualist and, and the Communist a Dialogue, and then uh, Declare's A Glance at Communism are um, not not sort of the one stop shop that I'd recommend, but they're a good way of getting oriented with how this fits into the fits into the broader tradition. 
Um, I think Carl Hess's anarchism without hyphens is also just a really kind of uh, beautiful programmatic statement of of sort of what the what the approach is and sort of what its promise might be. Uh, and and beyond there, I'd let it be guided by sort of what people are specifically interested in. Like if they're interested in questions about you know revolution and expropriation and so on, I'd give them you know like the the Roth, the the Carl Hass Murray Rothbard pairing where the specifics and confiscation of the homestead principle for people who are more interested in you know like healthcare say and give them an essay that's uh, focused on that uh, and so on. Why do you? <clears throat> Uh, I mean, this book did hedge uh, in many ways and it really pushed back, I think, against the historical tendency for market anarchism to be marginalized or totally excluded among the left. Uh, so uh, do, you, do you, either of you have any, have any uh, thinking on why uh, anti-market anarchism has so historically dominated um, these spaces and why market anarchism is consistently the underdog? Oh, because I think of the way in which um, the heirs of the market anarchists uh, found themselves for, you know, kind of historical reasons, allied with the right uh, in, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, fairly early in the 20th century. I think it just made it very easy for them to be ignored and sidelined uh, on the left because they had, uh, in effect, uh, picked a side. Well, I hope that means the the demise of fusionism. Uh between conservatives and libertarians helps uh, maybe uh-huh. get rid of some of that connotation. Although, you know, uh, certainly plenty of, of, I think, principled anti-market anarchists that, that do have interesting objections um, and questions about even consistently and principally left-wing market anarchism um, sure. from their perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, although, although, yes, the the... The pain of fusionism has clouded yeah. the discourse. Yeah, but so, I mean, my point. Or, sorry, go ahead, Charles. Well, so I mean, I, I guess what, what I'd what I'd want to nuance there is so so I, I certainly think that the long uh, uh, the long period of fusionism and the fact that many people from what we call the second wave um, you know had had their origins in what for uh, you know uh, a combination of genuine reasons and sort of. Um, uh, bogus political reasons came to be identified as sort of the old right, um, you know, that so many folks came out of that has, has certainly had its effects. Um, um, and, you know, those effects have sometimes been just, you know, either uh, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, sort of failures, uh, you know, just sort of failures to communicate, failures to appreciate each other's perspectives and so on. It's, all, it's also just led to a lot of difficulty in sort of figuring out how uh, how um, people from sort of uh, market anarchist perspectives and, and anti-market perspectives can even sort of get on the same page and sort of talk the same language in a way that they understand what values guide um, uh, uh, sort of each side's perspective. Uh, I do think that, you know, there's, there's somewhat more to it than, than that, since um, uh, you know, I, th- I think there is uh, uh, not at all the same kind of chasm, but you do see a lot of the same divide uh, back in uh, uh, back into the the intra-anarchist debates within the first wave, right? And Benjamin Tucker is an extremely influential figure, but also um, a figure representing a distinct minority view that was often uh, ridiculed and marginalized by uh, anarchist communists and by syndicalists writing in opposition. Um, and part of that, I think, is is just due to substantive disagreements between them. Part of it is also, you know, and Tucker Tucker is great. He's he's an ornery guy who likes to pick fights, um, uh, and uh, his his resolute determination to uh, read any you know read anyone who differentiated from the from the uh, Tucker plumb line on on property and so on to read them out of the anarchist movement led to a lot of sort of you know. Uh, uh, dynamics of, of kind of reciprocal excommunications and so on. Um, but there is, you know, there, there have also been, uh, uh, there have also been plenty of real difficulties that come from the, the left side of the ledger that, you know, um, uh, uh, many anarchists historically have been, have come to anarchism and, and uh, been sort of committed to anarchist principles by, uh, you know, through a route that, that, 
you know, sort of took them through the, uh, the swirls and eddies of the communist movement um, uh, or of non-communist labor movements. Um, this often made them sort of more, more interested in and more predisposed to uh, sort of understand the perspective of um, broad anti-capitalist critiques um, uh, than they were to uh, be interested in or sympathetic to uh, sort of critiques that attempt to salvage and defend particular aspects of real world market forms. Um, in the uh, in more contemporary debates, the the role of uh, the role of the ecology movement and of sort of green anarchism has has made a lot of really I think positive contributions to to anarchist thought. But it's also um, you know it's it's also led to um, uh, the development of you know sort of um, uh, a number of sort of primitivist and anti civilization other views within anarchism that that I would. Uh, I'd be flatly happy to say are more or less incompatible with uh, most reasonable versions of market anarchism. Uh, you know, sure. Markets are a feature of civilization. Um, uh, sort of market anarchism has within it uh, uh, sort of commitments to modes of uh, modes of production, modes of life that are very hard to square with deep ecology or primitivist viewpoints, uh, although they certainly have uh, environmental concerns. Uh, sure. And so, you know, this this has led to a lot of sort of dynamics where, you know, just sort of the natural, the natural sort of line drawing and friend picking and so on that happens within social movements has, has uh, uh, often led people with an anti-capitalist perspective to look more around to uh, sort of the anti-market folks that, that they're familiar with than to the uh, individualist and, and market form uh, critiques that, you know, that have, have, not been a big part of the conversation for some time. To, to speak to a lot of this, the substance of debates, you know, markets, not capitalism, very explicitly, very overtly and in your face, it's defending market anarchism. No, no apologies. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do, uh, whoa, do you think that markets and anarchism are um, in any important sense separable? Uh, you know, that when you attach those words together, are, you know, are you, what do you see as the relationship? Can you have a robust anarchism without markets? And can you have robust markets without anarchism? Either, either of you have any thoughts on that? Well, so let me just, just, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, please, you know, go ahead, Gary. <laughs> it's like the, like the, the second or third time we've, we've waited after long <laughs> gaps and both started at the same time. I'm not sure what that, not sure what that says. Um, so obviously part of part of the answer has to depend on uh, you know a uh, distinction that you know Charles helpfully makes between markets as commercial spaces and markets as spaces for you know social experimentation more broadly um and so you might think uh that at minimum um a recognizably anarchist environment would be one that would be hospitable to consensual interaction and social experimentation. Um, you might go on to think then that this would necessarily leave space uh, for markets in the in the narrower sense, but it might be in you know in a particular kind of anarchist uh, society that nobody chose to uh, to pursue. Uh, the option of, uh, you know, developing, uh, uh, you know, patterns of, of commercial interaction. seems to me it's a pragmatic question, finally, uh, how we organize uh, economic life. Uh, and I, my own view is that, uh, you know, there's a great deal to be celebrated about the achievements and the potential of uh, markets in that, in that narrower sense. But I certainly would want to say if somebody described an anarchist society that was genuinely open consensual interaction and social experimentation, but from which, as it happened, there, uh, there wasn't, uh, uh, you know, market interaction in that narrower sense, and people tried to, to mount uh, different kinds of economic arrangements. Uh, I might be skeptical about the long-term potential there, but I certainly wouldn't want to say that's not an anarchist society. Yeah, and so I, I guess I just want to add, so, so you know, um, uh, one one of the aspects of the distinction that that Gary points to in in that essay of uh, between um, this is from markets freed from capitalism right uh, 
in which I talk about a distinction between markets as as commercial exchange or as a cash nexus versus markets as um, uh, sort of a, a, a space of sort of maximal consensual social experimentation um, is that there there's also you know there's sort of a distinction to be made there between um, sort of markets in the sense of a of a historical institution right a series of of um, uh, a series of places and a series of social conventions of people meeting uh, as against you know sort of uh, uh, markets in the sense of an idealized set of norms that that we as market anarchists defend um, and so markets in the historical sense can clearly be distinguished from from anarchy uh, simply because you know like we've had markets a really long time um, you know hampered uh, hampered unfree deformed unattractively stratified markets um, but they are you know, recognizable as the sort of thing we're talking about when we say market um, and so we've you know we've had markets historically we haven't had a lot of anarchy um, uh, and so you know you can you can have one thing and not the other you could uh, mount various various kinds of defenses other than the defense of sort of the idealized norms that that we talk about um, that you know, sort of defends those historic uh, uh, those historical institutions as having a positive role, even if you don't accept the the anarchist, um, you know, the sort of individualist anarchist uh, uh, sort of ideological stinger that comes along with it. But you know, I I, I would want to say that that's that's something one can do. Of course, you know, the the reason the reason that I talk about those. Uh, you know, the reason that I talk about those sets of norms of social experimentation, of individual liberty, of spontaneous order, et cetera, is, is that I think the existing real world institutions, um, you know, have, uh, uh, have features latent in them, which can be brought out to greater or lesser degrees. And that's sort of the, the, um, uh, the fullest and most fruitful and most philosophically defensible understanding of you know, what it is about what it is about an agora, what it is about a bazaar uh, or a, a marketplace that allows it to play this kind of positive role is something that followed, you know, followed to the end of the road ultimately should lead to a, a fairly robust form of, of uh, should lead to a fairly robust form of individualist anarchism in terms of, you know, sort of its, uh, its guiding norms and principles and ideals. A lot of markets, not capitalism is in a strict sense, value-free in the sense that it is largely economic discussions, draw, uh, you know, drawing theoretical connections between, between various social structures and governmental structures, and thinking about the way incentives and institutions shape the, the, the kind of, uh, forms of cooperation that we engage in. So I'm curious, what if, you know, and, 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 and so they kind of go along with broader uh, you know, less value-free, you know, more ideological um, visions of the world um, as an egalitarian um, place. So, but I'm curious, what, 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 what is the proper response and what, do you, what should be done if maybe it turns out in, in the final analysis, um, you know, some of these arguments don't really pan out that maybe, I think one of the better I think one of the better questions to ask about this book, like Markets Not Capitalism, is that, well, it makes a very compelling case that there are a lot of informational and incentive distortions in capitalism, and that can be usefully separated from markets, in theory. But what if it turns out that uh, some of these predictions are wrong, and that, you know, perhaps specifically that when you really compare the informational incentive dynamics of modern capitalist institutions to, you know, hypothetical you know, a uh, freed market, uh, stigmergic worker cooperative, stuff like mm -hmm. that. Uh, when you compare, what if it turns out capitalism, capitalist markets, as opposed to anti-capitalist markets, still fare a little better and still might be chosen more often by free people? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, there might even be a case that I think that the capitalist as an economic function uh, could play a role in the division of labor, as, as which, mm -hmm. which this book, you know, wholeheartedly does not reject. Um, and in terms of uh, savings and consumption and bearing risk um, that that workers then don't have to. So, so how do you how do you think about these uh, ultimately empirical questions and how they relate to your broader ideological vision and goals? Yeah. So, so if if it helps, Corey, I guess um, 
you know, one, one way, one way to think about this, you know, sort of using, using the title of the book in a sense is part of the reason that the title of the book, um, aims to make this, make this, you know, sort of big distinction, you know, markets, not capitalism, right? Distinction between markets on the one hand, capitalism on the other. So part of that is to, is to sort of, uh, uh, um, argue for a conclusion. Um, but but part of it is also just to give terms in which to have a more productive and intelligent argument, right? And the the argument that that we're interested, um, uh, the argument that a lot of the argument that we're interested in having is uh, specifically to conceptually differentiate markets from capitalism because we want to uh, we want to know whether it's uh, whether it's true or false that markets cause capitalism or or that markets inevitably lead to capitalism, right? The, to Two different claims there, one of which is much stronger, right? The uh, um, sort of a, yeah. a way the world actually works sort of claim versus a way the world necessarily has to work claim. Um, but in either case, so we have this question, do markets cause capitalism? Individualist anarchists uh, historically have often argued, well, no. Um, uh, you know, the, the historical evidence for this is really weak. There's lots of historical evidence on the other side. Uh, uh, you know, of, of the sort developed by, you know, new left historians, also by libertarian writers. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's sort of a, a very, you know, there's sort of a, a big and helpful body of sort of economic work on knowledge problems and incentive structures created by state monopoly and so forth that we can avail ourselves of. Now, um, but it is at the end of the day, an empirical question, right, as, as to whether, whether or not it is the case that that market forms uh, produce capitalist outcomes. Um, uh, now, if we are, um, you know, the the um, if the view that is that is taken from different perspectives in this book that uh, uh, markets do not produce, but in fact can actually undermine capitalist outcomes when fully freed, if uh, if that you know if sort of the empirical uh, free market anti-capitalist claim, um, um, you know, if that should turn out to be false, right? So you begin by, you begin by doing some research to find out whether it's true. And if you find out whether, whether or not it's false, um, the, the further question is going to be whether there is, you know, whether there are normative reasons, you know, so these would be, um, you know, these would be chiefly ethical reasons, moral reasons, um, Sort of social and political reasons uh, to prefer non-capitalist or anti-capitalist outcomes uh, uh, to the capitalist outcomes that you're getting from market forms, um, and and if so, right? So so if there are reasons to think that like boss-worker relationships or landlord-tenant uh, relationships are you know, sort of uh, uh, bad in themselves or potentially corrosive of other things that you value. Um, uh, even though they do tend to come out from free market uh, forces. Again, this is, is arguing under the assumption that we're just wrong about the empirical question. Um, you might still take the normative view. And in fact, I do take the normative view that, you know, like if these things are sort of uh, bad and corrosive to other values, um, that's not a reason to reject market norms, but it is a reason within market norms to try and bring about, uh, uh, to bring about alternative social outcomes um, you know, through grassroots activism, right? Through the exercise of, of uh, individual liberty and liberty of comp combination. Uh, and so, you know, on, on this, I'd kind of point to another kind of pair of essays the, the, um, uh, in part eight, the uh, essay, Regulation Red Herring, and then my essay, We Are Market, uh, which is by Sheldon Richmond. It's a wonderful essay. Um, uh, and then my sort of uh, response to that and sort of playing with the ideas in that, which is uh, We Are Market Forces, the essay right after it. Right. So, you know, there's um, uh, there's an empirical claim the the empirical issue about whether or not um, whether or not markets might have uh, uh, capitalist outcomes, even without state privilege, doesn't actually yet settle the normative claim, which is, you know, should we try to bring about non-capitalist or anti-capitalist outcomes, uh, provided that we're operating within you know, provided that we're operating within market norms and, and you know, sort of the. The empirical claim that 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 um, you know sort of the moral and ethical case for anti-capitalism needs to sort of get up and running is is um, 
you know, is, is, is simply a, a, a possibility claim, right? It only has to be possible to have non-capitalist outcomes within a market forum, um, which, you know, um, uh, might turn out to be the case, even if markets by themselves uh, are sort of capitalist neutral, right? Um, uh, or even if they, even if they tend to favor capitalists, all other thing, you know, all, all other things being equal, right? Like, um, there's, there's lots of things people do in markets, um, that, you know, they're sort of paying costs to do, uh, and in, in some sense, they're sort of naturally against the, naturally against the grain of, of what you might expect to see, you know, children, uh, people don't send their children off to work, even though they can make more money by doing it. And, uh, uh, you know, there's, uh, sort of a, a variety of, there's a variety of sort of market outcomes that, that you don't actually need state enforcement if there are sort of normative values that are uh, guiding a large coordinated, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, cultural or activist um, uh, response. And, and I would just want to add to that, that you also don't see those outcomes, um, you know, when there are um, when there are more available options on the table. And so if you think that a crucial part of any recognizable market order, uh, radical market order, is the elimination of barriers to entry, and on the one hand, and on the other hand, increases in overall levels of prosperity, uh, for both of, the, you know, both of those factors are present, then uh, people unavoidably then become freer to opt out and try alternatives. That doesn't necessarily mean in any given case that that's what they're going to do. But thinking, for instance, about the uh, uh, the child labor issue uh, that uh, Charles raised a moment ago, you'd expect that people would, uh, you know, if that's not something they prefer, uh, they really would be much freer to to make uh, trade offs given barriers to entry into. Uh, the, the reduction in barriers to entry into uh, uh, income generating activities and the overall uh, uh, you know level of prosperity, so that they're you know we're not talking about uh, the kind of desperate poverty that might make people uh, more inclined to make sacrifices of that kind. So it's not just the norms, but I think it's the background conditions as well. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I think you know, like to to help myself to a little bit of economic framework here. There are a lot of um, I think there, there are a lot of sort of fairly pervasive features of, of actually existing markets that I would expect also uh, in affluent societies that, that I would also expect to be parts of radically freed markets uh, in sort of uh, future as yet unseen societies. So you have a lot of cases where you have these Kuznets curves, right, for uh, sort of social and ecological outcomes um, that, you know, sort of... Uh, People will do people will do a lot to make money to find new resources to exploit and so on when they're living in conditions of relative poverty um, and relative deprivation of options uh, that that they will um, uh, happily accept sort of the ha happily accept the costs of giving up foregoing working to clean up um, sort of as as they have the uh, you know, as as they gain the the freedom and the resources to do so um, and. So, you know, if it, I, I think it actually turns out in a lot of cases that non-capitalist outcomes are, non-capitalist market outcomes are less costly and more sustainable than sort of what we see in the world around us. That's why what we see in the world around us periodically needs trillion dollar bailouts to keep running. However, if it turned out to be the case that, you know, you have uh, some, some forms of, you know, uh, some forms of anti-capitalist uh, organization that turn out to be more costly, all other things being equal than, uh, you know, sort of getting a capitalist to run in there and do stuff, it may well be the case that if paying that cost produces uh, important social goods that, that um, uh, free people will, you know, free people can um, easily take it upon themselves to sustain, you know, to sustain the costs and, and to shift sort of what they're doing. Um, it sounds like on the issue of, you know, okay, so we're empirically wrong, but we are market forces. We can essentially, you know, to put in economic terms, treat uh, certain normative outcomes as consumer goods. And we can, if we generate enough wealth, then we can pay for those consumer goods. We, and we see this historically with 
um, the things like uh, you know child labor and uh, environmental degradation uh, in, so, in some ways declining as societies have more resources to not to have to uh, rely on those things. Right. And that all makes and sense to me. Spe specifically, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to jump in, but specifically child labor declining. No, yeah, so child, child labor declining um, uh, prior to the, you know, declining significantly prior to the adoption of laws intended to, to outlaw it, right? The laws became possible only yeah. because there were large shifts in the level of child labor, um, uh, part, both because sort of the economy, uh, you know, the economy was, was changing in various ways, but also uh, at, at the level of conscious activism because it became a major goal of, of uh, um, non-state recognized organized labor unions to uh, provide sort of uh, uh, other options and, and to provide strong norms against, uh, against child labor to, to sort of shift the equilibrium right. on, on that. Right. So, so, so my question is, you know, uh, it seems like, uh, you know, markets, you know, maybe, maybe they'll generate capitalism, but they also generate wealth and we can pay for anti-capitalism. We can, you know, uh, shop from, uh, you know, businesses that are owned and run by their workers that treat their workers better, that don't employ child laborers, that don't destroy the environment, that don't discriminate against marginalized people. This all uh, makes sense to me. I'm, uh, but I'm curious if if that's where we're at. Then there's almost a further question of, well, what are the factors shaping people's decision to either pay for capitalist institutions or anti-capitalist ones? Because what if it turns out that, okay, well, now we're wealthy enough to not to, to treat it as a consumer good that we don't want to, you know, oppress people in the workplace. And okay, so now we shop from worker-owned cooperatives. But what if workers do not choose that as a cooperative good themselves? What if we find that, uh, you know, the cooperative workplace is a little more burdened with informational and organizational inefficiencies than we find, that it's more burdened with interpoliticking and, and maybe, uh, you know, uh, social uh, stratifying within that firm that doesn't even neatly map onto the capitalist boss relationship, but is still maybe domination or objectionable on other terms, or just in terms of individual proprietorships and entrepreneurs. Uh, again, it doesn't it doesn't seem like all, any everybody will always want to treat that as a consumer good. Their autonomy, maybe the the burden of of, of it all is is worth less than than uh, or worth more than what they're willing to pay. Do either of you have thoughts about that? I mean, presumably, uh, the idea here is not to be paternalistically insistent that other people, for themselves, opt for the just the social forms we might prefer for ourselves or for them. Right. I, I strong. Right. I, I agree with Gary on that. That you know. So, um, so there there are two possibilities. I, I would take it if if you sort of look at um, you know so. Again, sort of un under the assumption that that all other things being equal, market forces end up leading to capitalism contrary to our expectations, which of course I uh, I, I disagree with. But let's let's stipulate that. Uh, if we also stipulate that a big part of the explanation for this is, you know, for example, you know, uh, workers don't want to work in those uh, in sort of you know like cooperative workspaces or union-owned shops or or whatever particular institutional form you take. Um, the, or, you know, uh, consumers don't care enough to, to pay for such things or, or what have you. Uh, there's sort of a couple possible ways you could think about that kind of hypothetical outcome, right? That kind of hypothetical outcome might be explicable in terms of cultural preferences that are, that are uh, sort of worth, um, you know, worth negotiating, arguing about, um, reconsidering. Or it might be that, you know, there are sort of real factors in these particular institutions that you know as as you say might lead to you know various kinds of internal dynamics and of course i do i you know they're they are in fact parts of internal dynamics and actually existing uh co-ops and worker owned uh worker owned enterprises it may be desirable to uh it you know it, it may be desirable to through you know through sort of processes of of cultural change try to encourage um uh you know try to encourage sort of a, a a broad culture of sort of, you know, stubbornness and resistance to authority and to sort of preferences for solidarity um, to other kinds of cultural values that that would tend to shift equilibrium points in terms of uh, you know, what sort of each worker by each worker 
or each consumer by each consumer is willing, you know, sort of uh, interested in what they're willing to accept and so on. Um, but, you know, I, I also want it to be the case that we're, you know, if you're interested in anti-capitalist things and you're interested in sort of solidarian sorts of things that, um, you know, there's, there's room to, you know, um, uh, you know, so do your research and listen, listen to what folks say about their workplaces and what they're interested in. And if it's not a problem for them, then to accept that it's not a problem for them rather than, uh, as Gary said, to sort of uh, come in with sort of a paternalistic recommendation about the, the kind of environment that you really ought to be working in or getting your, uh, getting your apartment from or, or what have you. Um, so, you know, on, on the one hand, there are strategies of cultural change that, that are, um, I think important and, and worth considering. Uh, on on the other, I would say that that in cases where you know there are um, uh, where there are sort of real problems with, for example, worker co-ops. Um, uh, you know, one of the one of the things that that you know sort of the, the way that I would think about sort of market anarchist approaches and market anarchist solutions to these kind of things is one one solution might be to you know like call a capitalist and just have them run things for you. Um, but another, you know, other solution, there are other solutions, which include things like, um, you know, sort of, um, uh, decentralizing, uh, decentralizing production market activity down to, uh, uh, sort of less collective, more individual levels, um, uh, that, you know, uh, it, it may be, you know, I, I think it positively is the case that, that sort of. All economic, uh, sort of all economic organizations and institutions that anyone's ever tried all have sort of built in problems and built in headaches and built in costs, though these are different between different ways of organizing production. Um, uh, and if anything, sort of uh, market anarchism and sort of the, the interest in sort of a, a radically individualist um, um, in a radically individualist and sort of authority skeptical form of entrepreneurial discovery, individual initiative, individual ownership is, you know, is ultimately a doctrine of perpetual revolution against all uh, forms of institutionalizing production that, that um, you know, markets provide a space within which uh, people can try out all different kinds of things in order to find out which provides sort of the best balance for them uh, uh, in terms of making a living in a way that is uh, sort of uh, Healthy, rewarding, and uh, and honest, uh, and uh, sort of connects people rather than turning them against each other. Just just before we go, and feel free to be brief. Uh, I wanted to ask, what areas should do you think left market anarchists be uh, working on now and into the future? Any specific things that our insights should be applied to? Work on, develop more. Surely we didn't all settle it 10 years ago, even though <laughs> I do love your book. All right, the market has spoken. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, I know you have to run, Gary. <laughs> uh, thanks so much, uh, both of you, for, for joining me and taking an hour and 12 minutes out of your day to talk about this book that you edited 10 years ago, Markets Not Capitalism. Um, it has a very interesting and delightful legacy, important to many, and I hope that we can get together 10 years from now and discuss the 20th anniversary. How's that? Excellent. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Charles uh, Johnson and Gary Chartier. Take care. Thank you so much, Corey. It's a real honor. And thank you to all our listeners for giving us your time. Join us next month for a new episode of Mutual Exchange Radio. And please consider supporting us on Patreon if you like our work. This month, we'd like to thank our patrons, Danny O'Brien, David Colborn, ASDF, ASDF, Acna Rolls, Derek W., Eric Fleischman, Humanosphere, and James Tuttle. Thanks everyone for supporting our work. We really couldn't do it without you. And thanks again for listening.